I'm going to start with Dr. English. Uh, Bill, as I've mentioned, trust is kind of a notoriously broad and perhaps even elusive concept. What exactly do we mean by trust? And what are some of the different approaches to thinking about how it is fostered? All right. Well, thank you, Mike, for the, the introduction and for setting the stage for us. Um, I think you're, you're right that uh, trust is an elusive concept. Um, on the one hand, there's uh, a widespread consensus that trust is important for the success of political and economic institutions. And at the conceptual level, as you pointed out, you know, trusting that others will make good on their promises is really essential to forms of human cooperation. And when we examine this empirically, as has often been done, uh, self-reported levels of trust are correlated with a host of desirable variables, uh, from GDP growth and democratization to health and longevity. But trust, as you say, is elusive. It's easy to destroy. It's difficult to foster. And there's even the question of whether we all mean the same thing when we talk about it in the abstract. One of the shortcomings, uh, it seems to me, in the way the trust is often discussed is that we speak of it in isolation. We want there to be more trust, but trust in itself might be a bad thing if those who trust are taken advantage of. In order for trust to be good for those who practice it, it has to be matched with trustworthy behavior. Thus, fostering trust in the final analysis, I think, also requires fostering trustworthiness, which is to say reasons for trust. And this is where I think the concept of trust is both distinctive and elusive. If I'm absolutely certain that another person with whom I'm dealing is going to make good on his or her promises, uh, you could say because there's a powerful legal system that's going to enforce uh, whatever arrangements we've made, um, that I really don't have to trust them, right? Uh, trust seems to imply at least the possibility that the person might do otherwise. On the other hand, if I have absolutely no reason to think he or she is going to do the right thing, then trust in another sense is kind of out of the picture. The real question of trust arises in that gray area between these two extremes, when it's possible that someone might let me down, but I still have reason to think or hope that they'll do the right thing and come through. When economists talk about trust, they often talk about it in the context of a so-called principal agent problem. So you have a principal, a, a boss or a manager, an agent, uh, an employee. Um, the principal wants the agent to do something, but the interests of them both might diverge. Uh, there's enormous technical literature, literature that's really developed to think about how you might restructure the agent's incentives so that they're in line with the principal's interests. Uh, and thinking about this in the context of, of when it's difficult to monitor their performance or when reputations are at stake. And the idea is that the more closely an agent's interests are aligned with the principal's, the more reason the principal has to trust the agent. As insightful as this literature has been, uh, its main weakness, I think, is that in considering incentives, economists have focused almost entirely on monetary incentives. Uh, they'd like to make it pay to do the right thing in the hope that this can be the basis for reasonable trust. Uh, and more recently, uh, as many in the room are familiar, you know, behavioral economists have enlarged this agenda by trying to examine how psychological quirks might be leveraged to shape people's behavior. And the hope is that understanding the ways that people are predictably irrational, to use Dan Ariely's term, might help us nudge them towards doing the right thing and thus make them trustworthy in that way. And I think both of these projects are important and they yield useful insights. But today, I want to draw attention to a third dimension, uh, and I believe a neglected area that's ripe for reflection. Uh, this involves considering the ways in which people are motivated by ends higher than money. Uh, by purposes that go beyond mere financial rewards or penalties, and because of that can form a more lasting basis for mutual trust. The fact that people are motivated by ends higher than money is, I think, obvious. However, it's something that can be lost sight of in business contexts that are focused on the bottom line. And moreover, I worry that both managers and policymakers are tempted to rely disproportionately on considerations of financial incentives because it's relatively easy to kind of measure and adjust them. However, at the end of the day, if somebody's loyalty is entirely a matter of money, it will be very hard indeed to trust them, except in those rare and precarious circumstances where they are fully compensated to do the right thing. And it's precisely because people's motivations run deeper 
that more lasting forms of trust can develop and enable organizations to flourish. So I'd like to very briefly sketch some concrete ways in which I believe this insight can help us address some practical issues of trust. Uh, and to do so, let me first suggest three important sets of, of principles and agents uh, that are currently facing crises of trust. First, I want to consider the distrust that exists between managers and employees. Uh, second, I want to consider the distrust that many shareholders have of managers. Uh, and third, I'd like to consider the current distrust of business at large that is routinely expressed in public opinion polls. In each of these areas, I think it's useful to rehearse how the problem appears from the conventional analysis of incentives. And then I'd like to propose how some deeper considerations of motivation might enhance our possibilities of developing genuine trust. So employees and managers. Uh, as you all know, at the heart of Karl Marx's famous critique of capitalism was what he took to be this fundamental antagonism between labor and capital. Uh, and the idea was that workers would be driven to subsistence wages, that if they complained, they could be replaced, while the managerial capitalist class could expropriate surplus value uh, for their own enrichment. And it's easy to see why, if this was actually the case, that um, uh, this would not be conducive to actually long-term trust. Of course, Marx's predictions were not borne out, in part because a dynamic economy is a positive sun game in which both workers and owners stand to benefit from cooperation. Moreover, a competitive labor market exists, and this forces businesses to pay workers a meaningful share of the firm's value, how, what it produces. And innovation is constantly creating new sorts of jobs and competition. So ultimately, then, the mutuality of capital and labor creates the reasons and conditions for cooperation and trust. And negotiating the details of, of this relationship uh, in a meaningful way is something that managers do on a regular basis. Obviously, the provision of decent salary, benefits, job security are important components of instilling trust in workers. Um, and in failing industries where resource constraints are tighter, this is obviously a more difficult uh, proposition. However, I also want to call attention to the fact that there's a great deal of evidence that employees are willing to trade off financial compensation if they can actually receive other things like pro project variety, less time pressure, or trustworthy managers in exchange. And I'd refer you in particular to a recent study by Halwig and Huang. This and studies like it suggest that trust in the workplace can be significantly enhanced by management's thoughtful attention to things employees value beyond money. In this context, it's also worth noting the curious fact, I think, that it's actually employees in the most highly compensated industries, law, banking, finance, who report some of the lowest levels of trust in management and others. Perhaps, and this is just speculation, the primacy of financial motivations in these fields um, is precisely what makes trust so difficult to cultivate. Whereas those, for example, who work in nonprofits report high levels of trust in job satisfaction despite their comparatively lower salaries, presumably because both they and their managers are intrinsically motivated by the larger social mission that the organizations they work for promote. And a final question to consider is whether higher purposes and better relationships can be cultivated in sectors that currently register low trust. Uh, there's a study I'm currently involved with for which we surveyed hundreds of lawyers and top law firms. And it turns out that if, in, if an individual had a mentor, this is one of the most powerful and significant predictors of their trust in management. And this may not surprise us that mentoring relationships contribute to a better work environment. What was surprising to us, however, was our discovery that official mentorship programs instituted by the firms were not responsible for significant increase, increases in trust, but rather this effect was almost entirely due to informal mentoring relationships in which the senior half exercised initiative in making the mentoring relationship happen and work. So the evidence suggests that the relationship, relationships matter for trust, but they matter all the more when they grow from a personal expression of care rather than a general company policy. Uh, very briefly, um, the second trust deficit I want to consider con uh, concerns the relationship between shareholders and managers. As you all know, there's been an astronomical rise in executive compensation over the last two decades, and one of the drivers of this trend has been performance-based pay, which attempts to align the interests of shareholders and managers by using by having a large amount of compensation issued in the form of stock options or bonuses tied to company financials. However, as Mal Salter at Harvard's Business School has documented in drawing together an enormous range of empirical research, these incentive systems have been widely gamed 
and an extensive and with executives uh, in many different uh, industries using accounting tricks to manage earnings and inflating financials, all to increase stock prices in the short term when the exercise dates are approaching, while failing to make the sort of investments that are important to a firm's long-term success. And this, of course, has led to a serious crisis of trust and management, and it sparked various new proposals for designing compensation packages, uh, including clawback provisions or longer vesting periods or greater personal liability. And while these may all be valuable in their own right, it seems to me that any board searching for a new executive team should be equally concerned with trying to select individuals whose motivations run deeper than just money, individuals who profoundly believe in the core mission of a business and can make credible commitments to manage for the long term. Finally, and even more briefly, I simply want to put on the table uh, the consideration of uh, problems of lack of trust in business at large. Uh, I have some statistics that I'd be happy to go over in the Q&A uh, to trace this, uh, the dimensions of this problem out. I think it's actually one of the most profound problems we as a country face going forward in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And thinking about how politics and business interacts uh, is one of the most important areas for, for trust, which managers have, I think, a unique and, and perhaps original role to play uh, in getting us through the post-financial crisis world. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm.